Спасибо. Thank you. Dear colleagues, dear friends, I'm very pleased to see you all and I'm very pleased to welcome you at International Virtual Symposium dedicated to achievements of modern science in combating coronavirus pandemic. And this event is held in preparation for an international forum that is uh, achieving the sustainable goals and uh, we are planning to hold this forum in April 2021. Today's virtual symposium dedicated to coronavirus infection is held together with our long-standing and reliable partners, that is WHO and UNAIDS. And allow me to introduce Ms. Shannon Hayder the deputy uh, of uh, executive director of uh, UNAIDS program and uh, also Dr. Hans Kluge, the director of European Regional Bureau at WHO, as well as Mr. Maksudov. And uh, I would like to welcome also all other colleagues that are in charge of uh, providing well-being of uh, our population in across our regions. Uh, Mr. Alexander Tarasenko, head of um, our Deputy Ministry of Healthcare in Respo Republic of Belarus. Mr. Kiyasev, Vice Minister of uh, Healthcare at Republic of Kazakhstan. Mr. Kurbanov Banjon, who is the ha deputy head of the sanitary service in the Republic of Uzbekistan. Today, the symposium brought together over 4,000 participants from 22 countries, and the symposium goes live uh, on the internet. From the very first days of pandemics, it was clear that the world is counteracting a very important challenge and all doctors today find themselves on the front of combating the infection. The Russian Federation was was one of the first to develop the diagnostic tools of testing tools for coronavirus and still these are very good tools in terms of sensitivity and specificity. Today, Russian developments are used not only in Russia, but in 40 countries worldwide, including Asian continent, Latin American continents, and so on. The Russian scientists took part in 12 missions for providing, for providing aid in um, 12 countries including New Guinea, Vietnam, and so on. Our approach to analyzing and monitoring coronavirus infection allowed us to provide efficient uh, response to COVID pandemic, decrease the lethality rate, and uh, decrease the damage caused by the pandemic. And uh, we can see nowadays a large number of publications worldwide dedicated to COVID and a large number of database. And uh, we understand also that the interest to COVID-related data causes a great number of um, not reliable data. And of course, scientific, scientific approach is key in counteracting pandemic because it allows us to identify weak points and uh, provide the advanced approach. Today, we would like to analyze our prospects for partnership. Today we will discuss the findings of the latest scientific studies. We will see what can be the contribution of the modern science and what can we do to counteract not only COVID pandemic but other diseases as well. 
Today, in the course of the first session, we will hear, uh, hear the key presentations, and in the second part, we will be able to discuss the key presentations and also be able to hear the response of our colleagues. We will. I hope we will be able to touch upon uh, the most relevant aspects and make conclusions. So allow me to open the first session of our scientific symposium. And if you don't mind, I will start my presentation. So without waiting any longer, if there are no objections, I will move on to my presentation. So dear colleagues, Unfortunately, you see a routine set of data for today, and you see, unfortunately, the incidence and spread of pandemic goes up. Unfortunately for us, as of today, we have registered 55 million of uh, cases worldwide. The number of uh, cured people is 38.4 million. The mortality rate is 2.4 percent. In the Russian Federation, a total of 1,097,000 uh, people were infected, 1.45 million and were cured, the mortality rate is 1.7 percent. Today, Russia is uh, ranked uh, six uh, in terms of the infection rate. And uh, if you look at the latest data, and the incidence rate, you see it uh, in the right part of the slide. The figures may be quite daunting for the Russian Federation. And uh, we see that per 100,000 people, the infectious rate is 14.7%. Uh, and of course, today's situation, given the rapid spread of coronavirus, uh, it is a very serious challenge to the modern science, and this is the first experience for the global community to provide response given all the tools we have, all the digital tools. And in the Russian Federation, uh, our approach is based uh, on the findings of the 17 scientific agencies of uh, Russian surveillance agency and other scientific organizations that work in cooperation with us and that provide important data and analytics uh, in our attempts to counteract uh, COVID pandemic. And of course, all measures that uh, we have are based on the scientific data we receive. At the same day, at the same time, uh, today's situation give impetus to develop different areas uh, of science. Here you see the milestones related to Russian Federation response to spread of uh, coronavirus. Of course, we started working back in late 2019 and uh, a few days before the new year, we started taking measures, and uh, I would like to pay your attention to the fact that the vertical uh, system of Russian Consumer Surveillance Agency covered a number of scientific agencies across uh, Russia, and uh, we did it to provide testing in all regions. Um, of the Russian Federation, we started producing PCR testing systems in January 2020, and we started uh, to look for pathogen in environment back in January. As of today, we have uh, issued more than 500 decrees in order to regulate our activities 
in quite new environment. If uh, you look at the types of our response, uh, we understand that different countries responded in different ways. And uh, we understand that there were three types of response that is passive, belated, and advanced. And uh, we understand that uh, introduction of number of advanced measures, and that is what Russia did, allowed us to slow down the pace of uh, coronavirus spread and decrease the lethality rate. And uh, the lethality rate in Russia was lower by two or three times compared to some of European countries. Right now we are looking at a spring season. The Russian Federation is large. We have 85 regions with different density of population. In Moscow or Yekaterinburg, the population uh, uh, we have very high density population, while in Krasnoyarsk region the density is not very high. And of course, we took into consideration these aspects as we planned our activities. Of course, it was very important to organize um, measures to protect uh, the territory from sanitation point of view and up to March we did it quite successfully. Up to the point our citizens started getting back from the European region and uh, in late February, early March, first uh, infection cases were registered in Russia. And of course, we responded to it uh, in a corresponding way. We started increasing the number of tests. As of today, we have completed almost 70 million tests every day we do around 600,000 tests. Uh, today, thousands of laboratories across Russia offer COVID tests, and uh, these are laboratories of federal medical agencies and uh, military agencies as well. These are also smaller laboratory agencies located at uh, medical facilities. And we have 200 laboratory centers that uh, are private, but they all serve to the same purpose, and that is to test the maximum number of people in order to reduce risks for the entire population. And here you see the testing coverage in different countries. Please uh, pay attention to the green curve that marks Russia, so you can see that we did not stop doing tests, uh, even when the infection rate went down. On the contrary, we would increase the number of tests and continue doing it nowadays. And uh, we, as of today, we have developed uh, seven diagnostic tools and uh, our scientific agencies continue developing new tests, more specific with higher diagnostic reliability. As for the vaccine as a prevention tool and an effective tool to counteract the spread of infection, certainly it would play an important role. And we understand that infection uh, can be efficiently counteracted only with the presence of vaccine. In, on the 11th of August, uh, we registered uh, our vaccine called Sputnik V, and it showed uh, very good results uh, during clinical trials. And uh, as of 13th of October, we registered another local vaccine called Epivac Corona that currently goes through the third phase of clinical trials. Uh, 
And uh, as for scientific uh, research uh, to identify peculiarities of coronavirus uh, spreading, it is very important area of research. It is very important for us to learn important lessons and plan our further research in the most efficient way. And of course, it is very important to understand the viability of the virus. It is very important to identify the presence of uh, the virus in water because, of, like many other countries, in summer we saw the increasing number of uh, cases and it was very important for us to understand uh, what would be the risk for people uh, going on vacation to the seaside and uh, we understood that uh, the risk uh, of uh, being infected uh, staying near the sea is not that high and uh, Studying the genetic changes of new coronavirus is another important area for research. And uh, we do it. Uh, we, do, uh, we collect uh, biological data from all over the country. And, uh, and there are different variants of infection uh, transmission uh, for us and for Vector to be oriented in the viral landscape of the territory of the Russian Federation. As of today, we see full genomes for 2,215 isolates of new coronavirus, and a part of them is represented in international databases. Uh, we've got also very interesting results uh, in terms of uh, genomic analysis at the premises of Vector and our research and scientific institute, Microbe, which uh, is dealing with uh, predominantly one or several directions that are specific for this particular institute. Microbe Institute is analyzing all the mass of uh, publications and literature related to virus per se to the changes of the virus that are registered anywhere in the world. And speaking about the results of the research of our scientific and research organizations are represented on this slide. And as of today, we see that genomic analysis of the virus in uh, Russia and in other countries says that in spring we've got the variants from the Western Europe, uh, G variant, and uh, the virus came from different uh, European countries, but we did not experience the inlet of the virus from China. There are no stems and no clades uh, from China that are circulating in Russian Federation. As of today, we also don't see uh, within uh, in between the variants uh, that are um, seen in Russia uh, uh, that are from China. And this is also the result of monitoring. We see the S uh, protein changes in, we see also changes uh, on the basis of uh, nine isolates in uh, Siberia. And we can uh, suggest that in this particular region, Siberia, we see the shaping of the new uh, domestic variant with uh, certain mutations that are typical for this particular variant. And peculiarities that we see in isolates in St. Petersburg uh, isolate and Chelyabinsk and Chelyabinsk region, uh, we see the decrease of susceptibility to Sivarvalenescent, uh, which is not showing additional mutations, but still we see uh, that some typical features for certain subjects of the Russian Federation. Scientific programs of uh, the R Russian uh, uh, consumer surveillance uh, agency show that uh, the Central uh, Scientific uh, and Research uh, Institute of Epidemiology is uh, now assessing the environmental manifestations of the virus in different objects. And as of today, we see a significant uh, amount of research in this field. We can see the virus and uh, disclose the virus in uh, different objects of environment. And correspondingly, we run uh, additional uh, Mm, 
events that are also a part of our norms and regulations that are suggested from our side. Also, the Central Research and Scientific Institute at the uh, Russian uh, Consumer Sur Surveillance Agency, we are uh, assessing the infections rate and instruments for the assessment and forecast of epidemiological situations. We've been tracing uh, starting from August. We've been uh, made a research of uh, approximately 13,000 uh, probes. And uh, we've got uh, the positive results of the probes uh, at the level of 10%, uh, positive findings. Uh, positive findings were including uh, different prevailing viruses, but in the first uh, uh, line, we've seen the rhinovirus, adenovirus, para, uh, flu virus, and there were almost no flu virus, although there was, of course, not a season in August for flu. And correspondently, we've been studying circulation uh, between the students and uh, uh, school children starting from the very beginning of the uh, school year 2020 and from the 1st September we've started the schooling and from the 7th of September we started our research and the presence of the virus in students and in the school children of the older classes were distributed uh, for uh, several weeks. Um, and uh, the positive findings were not uh, so high, 2.4%. And the in-person presence for students and school children for Russia is now sub uh, supported, excluding the subjects with the huge uh, representation of students and school children in population where we've uh, arrived at other measures. And of course, it is also very important to line out uh, the uh, instruments for uh, the assessment and uh, epidemiological situation uh, uh, of the population immunity. We have included 26 uh, subjects of Russian Federation, uh, uh, represented by 75,000 people, and we have get uh, the seroprevalence uh, diapason from 6% to 50%, and the morbidity rate, uh, which was also represented uh, was on the maximum level and the maximum collective immunity level was in children in preschool and early school age the children they produced immune response but clinics uh, there was no clinics uh, clinical manifestation and in the social professional structure the highest zero prevalence uh, was in healthcare specialists 48 percent almost and education staff uh, it's very important to note that uh, from April to June, the people who were engaged in uh, educational activities, uh, they had no direct contact, almost no direct contact, because uh, from April there was uh, no attendance to school policy in Russia. And the second stage is started from the 31st August. We see the changes. We could uh, use 70% of the data of the people who were uh, taking part at the first stage, and we've managed to cope with three groups of students and we need to say here that Kaliningrad uh, uh, region had a 50 percent and uh, uh, you see here the distribution uh, between 30 20 and 10 percent in different regions of Russia we see that uh, the Irkutsk uh, Nizhny Novgorod uh, Republic of Crimea uh, and Stavropol uh, region are significantly high and one more uh, step that was that is already realized and I'll manage briefly to disclose this already this is the secondary testing of the contingency and the people who were taking part at the first state and we see zero prevalence um, rate of by 60 and 60 plus percent in several regions Krasnoyarsk Astrakhan region and from 40 to 46 percent in Moscow Moscow and uh, uh, St. Petersburg region Stavropol region and Tatarstan Republic. And of course, there is uh, a less than 10% level of seroprevalence in regions with uh, small uh, and isolated population. We are analyzing uh, all the meta metadata as all our colleagues in other countries, but still, for us to uh, arrive at clear understanding of what will happen in uh, 
In February 2020, we've created the group for epidemiological situation monitoring, review, and uh, recommendation. And uh, our forecast rate is now 85%. And on the basis of our current forecast, we are planning our uh, activities and uh, arriving at uh, managing decisions. We have also developed our own portal for Russian-speaking publications and literature. Now there are more than 100, and of course there will be more. And we are working further uh, in uh, cooperation uh, on uh, the international platforms using the knowledge bases uh, uh, supported by our scientific staff. And uh, we are also analyzing our own activities. And in the last periods, from June to October, we've passed and adopted three important documents on the different platforms, like uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. On the uh, 30th of uh, October, we've uh, uh, passed the uh, overall plan uh, of uh, cooperative activities of the Shanghai cooperation countries. And uh, on the 14th, 11, 2020, we've passed uh, the 15th uh, meeting of the East Asian Summit Asian uh, with uh, the corresponding decision. And uh, on the level of CIAs, we supported for the next signature uh, the uh, overall uh, plan for the participants uh, of the CIS uh, with coordinated plan and coordinated plan on the reactions on of sanitary and epidemiological actions. And uh, the thesis and the agenda that uh, we are supporting uh, within the framework of our many years of experience is the following. Infections don't know any borders. Administrative regulation is not a border for an infection. And uh, unfortunately, we've been seeing this as an example from the beginning of 2020. And all the um, uh, the scope of our work and all the works that we've managed to do before were adopted and used as a basis of the documents that are already passed or are prepared as a draft for their further signature. And taking into uh, regard this uh, very important role of science in this complex situation, although we're facing a very complex situation right now with many losses and with the complexity of the situation per se, we are supporting the opinion that uh, our scientific staff should uh, be involved uh, in uh, the cooperation and in the shaping of unified and united approaches uh, to the situation. As of today, we've arrived at the decision that on the 9th and 10th uh, December in St. Petersburg, in the Yeltsin uh, Library, we were hold the International Scientific and Practical Conference in matters of um, counteracting of COVID and other infectious diseases. Now we already uh, see the reactions from the colleagues from 22 countries, from uh, the CIS, from Africa, from Eurasian Economical Commission, which supports our decision in these terms. And as of today, we see 200 uh, free participants and 2,000 additional participants are planned to be to take part in the broadcasting. And our program will uh, face the next blocks. Uh, the uh, uh, forecasting uh, epidemiology of the coronavirus uh, um, um, situation, development of the diagnostic systems, uh, peculiarities of forming of immunity, development and clinical tests of the vaccine. I want to thank you for your attention here and here. I want to use this possibility to invite all of you uh, to take part at the event in St. Petersburg in December that we are planning to hold in St. Petersburg. And again, I want to thank you very much for your participation at our symposium today. And as of today, we are happy to greet the Deputy Executive Director of UNAIDS program, uh, Ms. Shannon Hayder. Ms. Hayder is uh, uh, leading the program activities of UNAIDS and uh, supports uh, the strategic uh, development of programs and unites the efforts of our countries in uh, within uh, the actions of UNAIDS. We are working for a long period of time with UNAIDS and together with the uh, support uh, of uh, the government uh, of Russian Federation, we are uh, fighting against uh, the HIV and AIDS here. This is the phase three of our Pro project and during the last uh, years 
uh, three years. Uh, at the support of the government of Russian Federation, we've uh, delivered uh, 13 mobile clinics into six countries of CIS. We've uh, run tests uh, of uh, 2 million people uh, for HIV. We've trained more than 1,500 specialists in anti-infection works, and we've achieved uh, significant uh, uh, great results uh, in uh, fighting HIV transmission between mother and child, and we are also facing uh, this uh, incredibly uh, important situation and tense situation, and we do hope that today's coronavirus situation will not allow, and we will also not allow for any instabilities in counteracting HIV and AIDS. Ms. Hader, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for inviting uh, us to join this very important conference today. It is really an honor to be here with you all. Um, so I was asked to talk about how, how we are addressing these colliding epidemics. Um, what can we do to make sure, as uh, Dr. Popova said, we don't go backwards in our HIV response, even as we are all uh, fighting COVID together as well. And I wanted to start by thanking everyone who is attending here and in the audience, because I'm quite sure um, many, if not all of you, are at the front lines of trying to respond to COVID. Um, we are seeing all over the world that our HIV experience expertise leaders have been critical to what we do together for COVID. Uh, we've seen that lessons learned from the HIV response so far, including unfinished business, um, are informing the COVID-19 response. And I am going to emphasize that unfinished business because I think we're learning, even in these difficult times, how we make sure that unfinished business doesn't get worse, but instead we can find creative ways to go forward in finishing that business. We're seeing HIV infrastructure get leveraged and rapidly scaled up for COVID. And we are seeing from some of the principles that are successful against both of these epidemics, how this can continue to inform a future of better systems for health. So where were we for the HIV response globally before COVID? Um, certainly we've had tremendous successes together over the last 10 years, the last 20 years, the development of new health technologies, diagnosis, treatment, services. But there is also a difficult truth. And the difficult truth is that even before COVID, the world was not on track to meet our 2020 fast track targets, the global commitments for HIV and AIDS. There was a commitment to reduce new infections and AIDS-related deaths by 75% between 2010 and 2020. When we look here, we see even before COVID, at the end of 2019, we'd only received a 23% reduction in new HIV infections and a slightly greater reduction in deaths. Still too many. And this progress globally is different region to region. And certainly some regions have seen an increase in new infections and an increase in AIDS-related deaths. Collectively around the globe, our failure to meet these 2020 fast track targets will result, will have resulted in 3.5 million additional new HIV infections that wouldn't have happened if we were perfectly on track an additional 820,000 deaths from AIDS that wouldn't have happened if we were able to keep track with our fast track targets. That said, I think it is still very remarkable that worldwide we have over 25 million people now living with HIV and on HIV uh, treatment. This is certainly progress, even if we're still falling short. And I think when we look at the HIV testing and treatment cascade, our unfinished business across the world, we do see different patterns by region and different patterns by country. Um, here you see in the blue line is the first 90, the proportion of people living with HIV who know their HIV positive status. Um, and you see across the board, Eastern Europe and Central Asia is doing quite well on that first 90. Um, we do see then a gap, though, on the second 90 of those people living with HIV, who is on HIV treatment right now? 
and we look across the world and we see the variation in HIV treatment coverage rates that show us some of our unfinished business and how far we have left to go. That said, looking at these patterns also shows us, even in the time of COVID, where there might be more rapid or more agile wins with what we're learning and how we're responding to COVID. For example, when you're in a situation where there are many people who know their HIV positive status, um, who can be tracked and, and uh, offered services, there's a potential to rapidly catch up and start all those people on HIV treatment. They're a known quantity. But to do that well anywhere in the world, we have to understand who's missing, who has HIV, who needs services so that those services can be adapted and delivered sometimes in more agile or flexible ways that might be more successful in meeting the needs of people. Globally, 63% of all people living with HIV and new infections are among key population members and their partners. In Eastern Europe and Central Asia, that proportion is nearly 99%. And we know worldwide, members of key populations have challenges and barriers to accessing services that are important to them. Um, this shows that the average HIV testing status and awareness of status are much lower worldwide among key populations compared to that goal of 90%. And in part, um, this is not just about services. It's also because stigma and discrimination are still quite common across the world. In 25 countries across the world, more than half of all adults hold discriminatory attitudes towards people living with HIV. And these can be some of the most simple things, like saying that they would not purchase vegetables from a vendor of a, who is living with HIV. But beyond that, people living with HIV still experience discrimination within the healthcare system as well. These are reports of healthcare professionals having told other people about a client's HIV status without their consent, or people being forced to submit to a medical or health procedure, including coerced HIV testing, uh, because of their potential status. And beyond that, um, worldwide, we see discriminatory and punitive laws uh, against members of key populations and people living with HIV, which also create barriers to full transparency and services. So when we look at both our finished and unfinished business, what's been the impact of COVID-19? Well, at the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, um, UNAIDS along with WHO and some other scientists started doing some modeling of case scenarios saying, well, how bad could COVID-19 get for our HIV response? And this is an example um, looking at Sub-Saharan Africa just because of the volume of the epidemic that is on the continent. And we said, okay, just for treatment services, if we had a six month interruption in HIV treatment services, what would be the impact on the overall HIV response? And in this scenario, we modeled that in fact, there would be an additional 500,000 deaths from HIV alone, a doubling of deaths that essentially would bring the response in Sub-Saharan Africa back a decade to 2008 in just one year. But fortunately, um, what we've actually seen in reality is not exactly that picture. What we have seen is that agility, innovation, and leadership by governments, communities, and providers have been essential to either maintaining HIV-related services or recovering from the initial dips due to COVID-19 interruptions. This slide shows um, for key populations in particular, uh, disruptions in HIV services. Now, the gold color says that HIV services were pretty much stable. The dark pink actually shows where there's been some improvement. In some cases, some of the new models provided more flexibility for clients and the services actually got better. But that light pink color measures where services have been interrupted and disrupted. But those disruptions look different, not just over time, but they look different for different HIV services. Starting in the spring, we also, alongside WHO and other partners, started monthly uh, measuring of some key HIV services around the world. 
as you'll see this series of graphs, the different colors going progressively from left to right represent the monthly coverage or volume um, of those services. Now, encouragingly perhaps, HIV treatment services, uh, the world has done incredibly well on recovering from dips in HIV treatment services and finding ways to get HIV treatment continuation to people even with everything going on in COVID. There have been a number of reasons for this, including differentiated service delivery. Um, this graph shows the policy of multi-month dispensing um, that was in place before MMD. Uh, it shows where policy allowed from three month to six month pickup of drugs at a single time. We have seen that countries and regions who had policies and implementation of those policies in place before COVID had a much easier time in maintaining services once COVID started. We have also seen, however, a rapid shift in countries who perhaps had policies but hadn't fully implemented. And we've seen a major and rapid um, implementation to scale of MMD and other flexible services that perhaps had not been going that fast before. This is an example for HIV treatment services in Nepal, specifically for key populations, where after the service providers and communities noticed a dip in treatment coverage, they innovated and started home delivery of services and the coverage recovered. Um, now, we have seen for HIV testing services and particularly for finding people living with HIV who don't know they're positive yet, we've seen sustained and large decreases in the HIV testing services and the uh, finding of new positives. Now, only in a handful of countries have those services fully rebounded and only in a handful of countries has the expansion of HIV self-test kits which have proved to be very acceptable, particularly to key populations and to men, um, rebounded to a level or expanded to a level to start to compensate. Certainly, as Dr. Popova mentioned in the introduction, uh, this region is no stranger to innovative testing and service delivery strategies. This highlights one of our joint programs and the investment by uh, the Russian Federation in programs in the region to deliver services to hard to reach people. When it goes from testing to new initiation of HIV treatment, likewise, you can see across the board, we saw declines now, on some countries, we are starting to see recovery of those services, but that recovery is not yet in full. But by and large, um, the most impacted HIV services across the world seem to be those specifically prevention for key populations. Um, and the interruption of those services varies by place and it varies by population. Here are a few slides to illustrate some of this. Um, this shows the prevention services for sex workers, and you can see in the vast majority of countries, these services have not recovered to pre-COVID levels. Similarly, when we look at prevention services for men who have sex with men, across many countries, most countries, prevention services have not recovered to pre-COVID levels. Interestingly, when we look at this measure of pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, we actually saw a dip in PrEP coverage and then a fairly strong recovery. But I would note um, that even though we're seeing a fairly strong recovery in most countries, this is a service that is not available at scale yet across the world. We are barely at 10 to 15% of the 2020 target for PrEP coverage. So what is there is certainly being agile and recovering to serve, but the volume is still missing, just like it was before COVID. When we look at people who inject drugs um, and prevention interventions, we also do see some really um, recent uh, recovery and increase in some of these services. In fact, when we look across countries at interventions such as opioid substitution therapy or OST, as well as other harm reduction interventions, we're actually seeing both a recovery and in some countries we are seeing an increase. Um, 
For some countries, this is the first time flexible services like home carry doses um, or larger volumes of harm reduction materials have been provided rather than people who inject drugs having to engage the facility-based system over and over and over again to meet their daily needs. So that flexibility has helped a lot. But again, similar to PrEP, when we look at opioid substitution therapy, when we look at needle exchange programs and harm reduction, by and large across the world, these services are still way below the demand and need in terms of volume. So the services that are there have recovered and become more flexible, but that gap in absolute volume remains. So what are some of the lessons when we look at both of these uh, pandemics together, these colliding pandemics of HIV and COVID? Um, first, where we've seen for both, communities are critical partners to the solution. People living with and affected by HIV, people living with and affected by COVID can have large impact when they are at the governance, policy, and planning tables, helping determine not necessarily the what, but certainly the how to reach people and build trust in communities. They've been critical to innovations and direct service delivery and reaching those that are most marginalized. And they have been critical in community-led monitoring, being able to witness and provide feedback as to whether or not on the ground, in the communities, services are being received as they were intended and offered. We are also seeing um, an importance of reaffirming that, frankly, to get to the end of any epidemic, a rights-based response is an effective public health response. And we are unfortunately seeing some repeats of the early days of the HIV epidemic in terms of human rights abuses surrounding COVID responses. And I don't use that term lightly. I think there is a false uh, understanding that somehow uh, the public health response and the human-based response are in opposition, but they're really not. We can certainly have a public health response that includes restrictions and compliance but frankly, where those measures are evidence-based, they're time limited based on the epidemic, they're subject to external review, and most importantly, they make accommodations for the most vulnerable people to make sure that those restrictions are not causing greater suffering, but rather can help alleviate suffering for those most vulnerable. The other things that we're being reminded of by these colliding epidemics is that while both HIV and COVID are health conditions, they're about more than just health. Um, stigma and discrimination we are seeing around COVID like we've seen it around HIV. Um, we see that education is important. We see that social assistance, particularly for the most vulnerable is important to allow people to participate in the epidemic response and get what they need. And we see worldwide um, the importance that livelihoods and protection of workers and incomes will play in our short-term and long-term recovery. So finally, when we look at 2021, uh, what are things as UNAs that we are hoping for and looking for across the world and that we invite you to help with? Well, we do hope that as we look to 2021, we can see rapid recovery and acceleration um, for both COVID and HIV response. And this includes surging and in innovation in the HIV response to finish previously unfinished business. Um, we see success in countries implementing innovations now when possible and then sustaining those after COVID to continue to reach more people more effectively. And then finally, we are um, convinced that this latest experience with COVID to the world shouldn't be a call for austerity in health. In fact, it should be the first proof point, a recent proof point that failing to invest adequately, adequately in a health and pandemic response cost the world in terms of lives, but also in terms of economic costs and responses. So we invite you to join a call to action worldwide to call for a fully funded response that provides a right to health. And even with COVID, making sure that new technologies such as the vaccines that we've heard about today are available to all based on need, 
um, rather than based on wealth or geography. So thank you very much, Spasiba, for this chance to participate. And thank you so much for your partnership with UNAIDS and your um, dedication to the HIV response around the, uh, over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Haider. It was uh, very interesting. And uh, to listen to you, I can only comment that the Russian Federation is very attentive uh, when it comes to monitoring HIV infection spread in Russia. And uh, despite coronavirus challenge, uh, we are still having a high focus uh, for HIV. And uh, in early December, we are uh, launching the Federal Center for HIV Prevention and Prophylaxis. So it will be a great gift for our communities for December 1st. It is going to be a very important uh, and significant scientific facility. It's going to be headed by academician Pokrovsky, and this center was been or has been organized for a number of years. Construction took uh, several years. Finally, it is almost ready. Thank you very much for your interesting report, and uh, thank you for highlighting main areas of work. Well, dear colleagues, and now I would like to give the floor to our next panelist. That is the director of the European Regional Bureau of WHO, Dr. Hans Kluge. Hans Kluge headed European Bureau on February 1st in the midst of pandemia when it was already clear that uh, we are facing a huge challenge and and uh, he took a number of measures in order to prevent the spread of a pandemic. He already had good experience in the area of uh, counteracting infections. And I would like to thank you for your attention to the problems that uh, we observe in Central Europe and Asia. And we understand that the coordinating effort of WHO is instrumental to overcome a number of problems in healthcare sector. And uh, during the 70th session of uh, European Regional uh, WHO Assembly, we have approved the European program that reflects a joint uh, uh, co cooperation program in the European region. And there are three uh, main aspects that is providing medical uh, access uh, to medical services and also developing a healthy society. And it's very important to reflect uh, these issues in the uh, final document. Uh, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Dear Professor Popova, dear Ms. Heide, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the possibility to speak in front of you in the midst of challenging times. This symposium is very important because we are combating the COVID pandemic altogether. I would like to talk about the results and findings we have at the moment and what lessons we can learn so far in order to identify our future actions. The impact of pandemic is quite diverse. And uh, we understand uh, that uh, the marginalized groups still suffer significantly from economic and social shocks caused by pandemic. Worldwide, we see that there is not equal access to medical services and the vulnerable groups, including the 
the patients with HIV are not always able to receive medical aid and uh, other types of assistance. So we've been large hopes on the vaccine. However, this technology is not able to fill in all the gaps. Political will and actions aimed at satisfying needs of every member of our society must precede the vaccination process. Looking at the latest problems, uh, we have, uh, as the managers of the healthcare systems, be it in Russia, in the Central European region or Central area, uh, must uh, be looked at uh, with a count of lesson learns, uh, lessons learned over the past nine months. They can be very useful for us and guide us in the future. First of all, our healthcare systems are our best tools to combat uh, infection. And uh, the basis uh, uh, should be provided by medical and sanitary aid, and that will pro protect uh, our society, including most vulnerable groups, in order for healthcare systems to respond in an adequate way, we must invest significantly in the primary segment of healthcare system. We also need to look at alternative platforms of providing services. New opportunities, digital technologies can help us eliminate barriers in providing medical aid. During my recent visit to the Russian Federation, I was especially inspired by the extensive use of telemedicine in responding to COVID pandemic. Lessons that we learned here are very important for our entire region. WHO supports uh, countries in developing technical recommendations that uh, can be very helpful for the entire European region in preserving and providing main medical services. For people living with HIV, it also means receiving antiretroviral therapy medicines for several months in advance and we can engage career services or communities in order to deliver these medicines for the patients and also provide telemedical services to those patients. And here an important role is played by the staff members of healthcare system. In the first line, we need to take into account their stability and their viability. We need to provide them with the necessary psychological, material and financial support. If we will not uh, support our medical staff, what is the healthcare system that we can speak about? And here I'm arriving at uh, point two of my today's speech. Together we are better. Together we are united and we are better when we are united and we have to work together. The prospects of vaccination lead to unprecedented overall response and uh, engagement in uh, restoration. On the basis of solidarity, of course, the support of Russia, uh, support of the member states in uh, uh, f strengthening of laboratory potential, epidemiological over uh, watchdog, and uh, this all can be a support that is rendered to everyone. And I'm fascinated by the striving of Russian Federation in uh, the support of uh, other member states in uh, their struggle against COVID-19. And here, as a director of uh, W, as a regional director of uh, WHO, I want to say that we are not leaving everyone. Uh, 
aside. Our program will work for the next five years. As Professor Popova told, we are together working on the betterment of healthcare situation, and it is adopted by all 53 member states in the face of this crisis. The program is now realizing this particular approach. And the first uh, the first idea of fairness means that there is no, one, not one country that will play a lesser or insignificant role. We will not let everybody without attention. Now I'm passing to the point three of my today's uh, presentation. The development of strategy for a, to warranty the fact that the vaccine will be provided for all in need um, in a timely manner. This is made for everybody not to be left without vaccine. This is also a sign of uh, invitation of Russian Federation and uh, R Russian uh, consumer surveillance agency for uh, coping with individual needs of all members of our societies and communities. For this work, you, you've chosen the basis of uh, the human welfare and of equal uh, support and equal dignity and fairness at the definition of groups uh, of uh, population for further vaccination against COVID-19. After active uh, commu active cooperation with communities and uh, a group of companies uh, which is uh, working with vaccines and developed by vaccines. They are already including HIV positive people, people who live with HIV for the further tests. Now I want to convince you that uh, we are ready to and we are uh, playing the un un uniting, uniting role with uh, all member states in work with all of our partners as the partners and members of all civil society organizations and uh, state agencies. We are we're also working with international platforms and initiatives such as uh, Eurasian Economic Union, uh, the Council of uh, CIS, or the well-established Pan-European Commission on Health and uh, Sustainable Development, which I, together with the First Minister of Italy, Professor Mario Monti, are supporting to us to redesign policy in uh, the sphere of these pandemics. I want also to tell you and to grant it that the WHO and we are all together searching for the additional access for to vaccines for the states that are not members of the European Union. For example, here we are working also closely together with Russian uh, Federation on uh, the norms and regulations and channels of the delivery and of a sufficient vaccine or other vaccines uh, and vaccines to the people. We are also leading global strategic consultancy groups of leaders for immunization and here, a huge role uh, is played by the recommendation granted by the Italian group of the technological support of vaccination uh, in terms of uh, groups uh, and risks assessment uh, in the vaccination and epidemiological context. During this current pandemics, I already used to speak that nobody can be safe before everybody will be safe. Not a single country will not handle it alone. This will be the case also after vaccine will become reality. If we want to protect ourselves from the further crisis, we have to not, uh, we have to not leave anybody alone without attention. I want to thank you for your kind attention and I want to wish you good health. Yes, thank you so much. Dr. Kluge, we also want to thank you. And uh, additionally, I want to stress it out that the many things are important uh, and many things we will also speaking uh, and di discussing together with you uh, during your recent visit to Russia. And I know you've been uh, discussing this also with uh, Mishustin, with the head of the uh, government of the Russian Federation. Thank you for your visit to Russia, for your recent visit to Russia. And I think it was very important and a very productive one. 
one, because we've managed to discuss many issues. Thank you very much, Dr. Kluge. And now the next presenter is the General Director, Chief Executive Officer of the State Scientific uh, Vector Center of uh, Virusology and virology uh, at the Russian Consumer Surveillance Agency. Uh, this uh, agency is uh, working as an international reference center of the viral landscape within the country. And here I can also say that during our two-day symposium we see a, a huge interest here. We started by 700 and now we are evidencing 1,360 participants from all over the world who are listening to our symposium right now and taking into account the fact that one of the first uh, news is that Vector has seen the new isolate of the virus in Siberia, in Russia. I want to say that no mutations that we are seeing on the territory of Russia are not affecting the epidemiological uh, significance of uh, certain variants and isolates of the virus. Everything that we are seeing and evidencing on the territory of Russia, this is not for the best of the virus. Uh, this is not weakening the virus and not enforcing the virus, but we are still tracing all the minor changes. This also speaks about our technological approach and uh, about our uh, safety of the working with material. And uh, uh, Renat Maksutov will be able to disclose this already today. We see many changes, but all the changes that we are now seeing are not affecting any epidemiological aspects of the new coronavirus. This is the case as of today, and now I'm letting the floor to Renata Mirovich Maksutov. Renata Mirovich, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Yurievna. Thank you for the possibility to speak together for our colleagues. Dear colleagues, distinguished colleagues, I'm happy to greet all of you on our two days virtual symposium on the most important topic of uh, today, and I'm happy to present the uh, report on the results of clinical studies of the Russian vaccine epineferon. Uh, just a couple of slides on the Vector uh, State Center. The Vector uh, State Center is the biggest uh, research virological center at the Russian Consumer Surveillance Agency in Russia, and we are supporting the research and supporting the uh, global uh, work uh, on in antivirus uh, policies. We have uh, uh, the highest levels of uh, biosecurity and have about 1,000 employees. We have a federal collection of viruses, including the most dangerous pathogens. Uh, there are only two collections in the whole world of such kind. We also have a natural smallpox virus. We have a laboratory of animal breeding and holding facilities and original cell cultures collections, starting cell lines certified for use in biopharmaceutical production. And we have also preclinical research center and GMP certified biopharmaceutical facilities. On the international level, Vector has activities uh, for a long period of time with the WHO, and starting from 1997, we are one of the two uh, cooperating uh, uh, centers uh, with WHO in studying the natural smallpox. And during the last 13 uh, years, we are uh, the one the, and only uh, certified in Russia laboratory for bird flu between in between with 13 laboratories in the whole world, and we are the WHO COVID-19 reference laboratory. And again, there is only one such lab in Russia. Uh, speaking about the false sector of research, we are providing tur turnkey solutions. We're fundamentally researching and manufacturing capabilities at SRC Vector. Uh, in basic research, we make identification and study of targets for development diagnostics, run preclinical and clinical studies and tests, and make production and market entry. And speaking about um, today's topic, development of vaccine uh, against COVID-19. As of today, this uh, we are developing uh, on the basis of 10 uh, platforms in the whole world. There are more than 300 to uh, 200 uh, uh, vaccines in development, including clinical studies for 48. As of today, Russia 
registered two vaccines uh, that are licensed. Uh, one vaccine is based on viral vector and one vaccine is based on peptide antigens. And in the nearest time, we will face the new registration of the inactivated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And starting from the January 2020, we started to provide to work on six different vaccine platforms um, and these platforms that were suggested and used by the vector uh, platform they took into account uh, our colossal experience in uh, struggling and fighting against Ebola in Africa and we were working on the basis on uh, the vesicular stomatitis virus uh, flu virus and three uh, vaccine lots uh, that were synthetic and uh, all these six platforms are use, uh, used uh, against uh, other viruses and starting from January 2020 when we arrived at the task of the development of uh, anti-COVID-19 uh, vaccine development we've used uh, the previous vaccine platforms um, uh, to fight against COVID. On the stage one, we've uh, developed all the prototypes. We've ran tests on uh, in vivo laboratory animals. And we have chosen the three most prospectful platforms in May. And the best uh, platform was uh, to turn out to be uh, the platform on the base of peptide antigens. And it was registered. And the majority of uh, vaccines uh, for uh, against SARS SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, is using the shortened uh, SARS-CoV-2 as the specific antigens. It uh, also consists of immune suppressive domains and uh, it is also supporting uh, its work on the level of antibodies. And here at the development of peptide vaccine, we've used alternative approach uh, for the development of um, SARS-CoV-19 uh, vaccine, they are providing for the immunity but exclude uh, immunopathological fragments. We need to say that the development of immune uh, suppressive domains that can suppress the immune response uh, is made by different companies. Now we have uh, seven different uh, uh, client, uh, changes uh, and tests that are ran in the world. And here we're speaking about synthetic peptide vaccine development. This is the outcome, the outline. Actually, the first we're starting from the computer design of peptide structure. Then we run tests and uh, uh, we choose the variants uh, of uh, these peptide structures in vitro and in vivo. Then uh, we, uh, after trials, we uh, make the vaccine composition finalization. And then we go to manufacturing of the peptide vaccine. And all the five steps are taking only several weeks starting from the moment when we arrive at the tax tasks for the development of vaccine this is just a classical clinical studies of the vaccine and clinical studies with registration and license work uh, of course there are advantages of the synthetic peptide, pep peptide vaccine technologies uh, such as rapid design in the matter of days and manufacturing in the matter of weeks but I wanted to speak about immunological safety of synthetic peptide peptide vaccine because the epitope selection on the stage of peptides uh, design, it is made on the stage of peptides design step to exclude antibody dependent enhancement of infection, immunity suppression, cytokine storm and antigenic similarity with human proteins which uh, provides uh, for uh, halt of autoimmune diseases. Immune response to uh, and the design of peptide vaccine is as follows. After the tests, we've chosen uh, three best peptides that are uh, efficiently uh, producing the anti uh, antibodies. Uh, we see the new nuclear protein to the new coronavirus. We are using hydroxide of aluminium and pro provide vaccine as a suspension for uh, Ws. And here we want to speak about uh, the best parts of Epivac Corona, which is manifested in its high efficiency because of the uh, stems uh, that are were used and because of the immune su suppressive conditions. As uh, Dr. Popova already told, the genetic uh, changes within the Russian Federation are controlled within 
the uh, Russian Consumer Surveillance Agency, and this uh, control is ran in all of the regions in Russia. We are running genomic sequ sequencing of all the changes that are taking part on the constant basis, and all the changes that are now registered, they do not have any effects uh, or they do not uh, alter pathogenicity of this coronavirus, and they are not uh, able to go away and hide from the immunity uh, that is achieved on the basis of APVAC corona. And additional uh, advantage is the vaccine safety. Unlike most sub-unit vaccines, a peptide vaccine contains only short regions and can be used uh, uh, with a feature of increased safety for immunocompromised individuals and uh, with immunosuppressive conditions. We don't have additional phone uh, virus uh, uh, viral parts in uh, revaccine, which leads to an easier revaccination and uh, the data that we have in the world in the analysis of uh, uh, the world metadata shows that the immunity that is uh, formed after a COVID-19 case will in the majority cases not lo be long-lasting which will uh, provide for additional revaccination in the later time and easiness of production and stability of components uh, in storage conditions from two to eight cells will make it possible to use existing logistic processes. Uh, within our work, we developed three different animal models for COVID studies, which were not uh, combined, uh, which were also recommended for the other organizations of healthcare, uh, for, uh, such as hamsters, NHP, and ferrets. And on the models of hamsters and ferrets, we've showed a high immunogenicity of the development uh, vaccine the titers, titers of antibodies on the 28th day were uh, more than one per 10,000. And on the primates, on green apes, uh, we've uh, seen the titers uh, of antibodies uh, on the day 28, which was more than one than to 10,000. And as of uh, immunogenetic properties and protective efficiency, we've seen uh, the ferrets models uh, and uh, hamsters and in hamsters, we were we were seeing uh, protection from uh, the uh, from the lung and body mass index and uh, the the, uh, the the better results than in placebo groups and in uh, primates we also seen uh, uh, lesser cases of pneumonia development. Uh, uh, then let us speak about uh, safety studies. Uh, we've uh, ran the stages of preclinical safety studies on APVAC corona. We've studied more than 1,500 uh, different animals. We've uh, made a research of all series of APVAC corona according to the all regulations and norms for proving of uh, safety. And here, as the result, we've seen the full safety uh, for laboratory animals and now we uh, then we came to the epivac corona vaccine studies in people in volunteers and on the 27th of june we've uh, made the first vaccinations uh, it was placebo controlled randomized blind uh, trial of uh, safety unigicity on the volunteers we recruited a 14 volunteers at the first stage, and uh, the study initiation took place on the 27th of July, and uh, then we added nine more volunteers, and uh, as we demonstrated high level of safety on 14 volunteers, we moved on to phase two and the distribution between the uh, group that received vaccine and placebo group was 50 50 we observed the condition within 43 days and uh, we still continue observation of those uh, 
subjects uh, up to now, and we'll do it for several months to go again. Vaccine is a suspension, and this is uh, double-time um, vaccination. First of all, we were able to demonstrate high safety of the vaccine. Only six uh, volunteers had somewhat painful sensation at the moment of injection. Vaccine does not cause any systemic reaction or general reactions such as a fever, headache, etc. It does not cause any adverse reaction and uh, that makes us believe that the vaccine is well tolerated. As for immunogenicity of the vaccine, 100 uh, percent uh, uh, antigen specific antibodies were received on the 40 day for on the 22nd, uh, 21st day after the second vaccine nation and uh, we can see that the protective type are uh, easily hyper reactive double uh, time vaccination spurred the activation of uh, protective response uh, and uh, that was uh, observed in the high number of volunteers. Based on the data we received, uh, we were able to register Epivac Corona vaccine, vaccine in the Russian Federation. The studies uh, on 100 uh, volunteers continue to go. We already observe very good results, especially among those volunteers that had contact with the virus. In the near future, we will move on to the next stage, that is post-registration clinical trials. The first uh, trial already started. The next one will start in the near future. Altogether, we will hold independent post-registration trials, and that will be part of an open control trial for immunogenicity with the involvement of uh, subjects uh, over the age of 60. And uh, we also will do the study uh, with uh, the involvement of uh, children in the age of 14 to 17 years. And we also will hold multi-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial of preventive efficacy. And uh, we will engage volunteers starting from age of 18. We will engage uh, 3,000 volunteers and then move on to 40,000 uh, volunteers. So, Epivac Corona is the Russian vaccine that represents a suspension consisting of cocktail of SARS-CoV-2 peptide antigens con conjugated to a carrier protein. It demonstrated its efficiency during two time use within 21 days and also demonstrated a very high profile of safety. It is recommended to store it uh, at temperature range, or a range of 2 to 8 centigrades and uh, further studies of the vaccine stability may extend its shelf life to two years. These are our plans for further work in order to test stability of the vaccine in order to extend its shelf life. At the moment, we do additional analysis of the vaccine. As I said, we already did the study to decrease the interval between two immunizations. Now, this interval amounts to 14 to 21 days. That already is uh, reflected uh, on the infraction used for the vaccine and uh, 
I hope that in the near future we will move on to the trial where we will be able to engage uh, subjects in the age of 14 to 17 years. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, very much, Renat Amirovich, for this interesting report. And uh, I must say that the introduction of suspension is uh, does not cause any painful sensation, and again, vaccine is very well tolerated. And as of yesterday, we started the clinical uh, trial with uh, the engagement of uh, uh, subjects with, uh, in the age of 60 plus, and we understand this is one of the most vulnerable groups of the population, and uh, we are looking forward to receiving results because for us it's very important to provide protection to this part of our um, population. So we are wrapping up the first session of our symposium. I would like to thank all our speakers and uh, all our attendees. And now I give the floor to our co-moderator, to Natalia Ladnaya. And uh, I wish you to have a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Anna Yurivna. Thank you, dear speakers. We heard great reports. There is a lot to discuss. And now we are moving on to the discussion part. And uh, in the first part of the second session, we will listen to the reports from uh, uh, CIS countries' representatives. And uh, I give the floor now to uh, the fallen speaker. And again, we are discussing COVID pandemic and the challenge to our science. And uh, again, I would like to ask uh, all speakers to keep up the protocol. So the floor is given to Alexander Tarasenko, who is the Deputy Healthcare Minister of the Republic of Belarus and Chief Sanitary Doctor. Mr. Tarasenko, the floor is yours. Uh, yes. Good day to you, dear colleagues. Uh, of course, uh, coronavirus pandemic impacted uh, all spheres of our life, economic, social, and so on. And that is true for the entire global community. And uh, countries today use uh, various resources based on the experience uh, of uh, different countries. The Republic of Belarus uh, has its uh, unique experience in organizing preventive measures and providing medical aid to the population of the country. Of course, the pandemic uh, has uh, changed uh, our approach to providing medical aid to various uh, groups of patients, including those living with HIV. We do our best in order to uh, curb the infection rate and uh, in order to be able to keep up to UNAIDS uh, targets such as 1990. Of course, there is a risk that we won't be able to reach all the targets, although we are doing our best in order to achieve those goals. The efforts made by the government are aimed at uh, providing education to our population to maintain human values and to, to eliminate stigma and to provide uh, decent living conditions for those living with HIV. In order to minimize the risks, we study the best practices and look at uh, the opinions of uh, best actors. Experts. We would like to thank the service uh, of uh, the consumer surveillance um, in Russia and Ms. Popova personally for providing us the help. And we also would like to thank uh, Ms. Popova for organizing this symposium because here we discuss uh, 
relevant issues for all of us, such as Kerbin, HIV infection, and coronavirus infection. And uh, it is very important to understand the circulation of the virus in different environments. Uh, the experience of the Russian Federation when it comes to forecasting and modeling epidemiologic situation is very interesting. We also are very appreciative for the report given by the uh, by Mr. Maksudov, the general director of uh, Vector Agency dev that developed the vaccine. And uh, we are pinning large hopes on the vaccine. And of course, in order to be successful in counteracting the pandemic, we need to unite uh, at the local, regional, and global level. And in this regard, it's uh, very important to develop cooperation. With this, I would like to finish. I'm ready and open to any questions. Thank you very much, dear Alexander Alexandrovich. I suggest that uh, we listen to all questions during our next session. And now I would like to give the floor to General Kiyasov, Vice Minister of Healthcare of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Chief for Sensory Doctor. The floor is yours. Greetings, distinguished colleagues. From the very beginning pandemics, to uh, provide a plan of actions against the coronavirus infection in the Republic of Kazakhstan, we've arrived at the next set of measures uh, at the level of the government of Kazakhstan. We've created a uh, commission on uh, the uh, uh, prevention of coronavirus. On the level of uh, government, we've uh, uh, backed this plan and uh, enhanced the sanitary and epidemiological control on the borders, and we created uh, also additional points of diagnostics of COVID-19, and we've limited the uh, mass gatherings and mass events. Starting from 16th May, uh, we've uh, introduced uh, the external status of the country. Unfortunately, after the uh, corona anti-coronavirus measures were um, depleted, uh, the majority of the population neglected uh, the further measures and neglected uh, uh, and uh, the uh, internal and external migra migration of uh, the population was uh, lead, uh, has led to the significant load on the healthcare of Kazakhstan. Then we introduced uh, the strict uh, quarantine me uh, events on uh, the Republic. We are further developing the norms and regulations on healthcare systems and we've introduced introduced norms on uh, limiting events, including quarantine within Kazakhstan. Uh, we also passed sanitary rules and guidelines and uh, introduced uh, amendments and ad additions to the 14 sanitary rules uh, within our country. And to prevent the infection uh, uh, growth and uh, to, be, uh, to, to be ready to uh, the next uh, months and years, we are developing and we already developed the metrics of the assessment of epidemiological situation. On the basis of these metrics, we are taking the decisions on uh, the uh, enhancement or uh, depletion of limiting uh, measures. Now we are supporting 139 laboratories that are running the assessment, uh, including 70 private laboratories. We have also 42 laboratories within medical organizations and veter veterinary stations and laboratories. To control the uh, coronavirus infection and to localize uh, the, uh, the, the, the points uh, of uh, with the highest registration uh, numbers of coronavirus, we are providing the uh, enforcement of control of uh, anti-COVID policies. We are running the log of all COVID uh, cases and uh, creating the day-by-day uh, -day statistics. We are working on operative uh, tracing of uh, contacts uh, of uh, people having COVID-19, and we are introducing the data of. Uh, 
uh, persons uh, uh, visiting uh, our republic and uh, we provide monitoring and control with digital uh, technologies. We are also uh, uh, using the Google technologi technologies on uh, notification, uh, which is realized as an application. The application is anonymously um, showing uh, the links and contacts uh, between persons and uh, in an encrypted mode, uh, it also provides the data on uh, cooperation between uh, holders of certain uh, certain gadgets. We are also creating uh, the development of uh, Zertio application, which has three main modules, entering of uh, social places with QR code, then uh, a questionnaire of uh, passengers uh, that arrive to the Republic, and uh, the mode of I am on quarantine. QR code can trace time and place uh, and uh, residence of the user of the application, which is widely used in cities and uh, in the community centers. At the entrance to the um, uh, social places and highly social loaded places, we are uh, planning to engage this system. We are also uh, working on a manual level with manual uh, 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 manual support of the log and data. And we are also uh, leading the diagnostics, further diagnostics on the basis of PCR tests. Uh, speaking about vaccination, uh, we are providing vaccination of people who are part of the groups with uh, severe risk. Uh, the Ministry of Healthcare in Kazakhstan Republic is uh, leading the work on um, purchase of the vaccine and planning of the purchase of the vaccine against coronavirus. The ministry is uh, also studying world data on the development of vaccine and assessing the groups that are that have to have the vaccination but as of today uh, the most prospectful uh, immunization tools for Kazakhstan Republic are the next candidates vaccines Sputnik V vaccine of the National Research Center of Epidemiology and Microbiology of Gamalia and Ministry of Healthcare of Russia uh, AstraZeneca vaccine a vaccine of Sinovar Beaters and additionally as of today we are working that on the development of locally produced vaccine within the research and institute uh, at the committee of the science at the Ministry of, uh, of Education of the Kazakhstan Republic as of today we see preliminary calculations for this vaccine and we need to mention that uh, We've ran the first and the second cycle of uh, uh, clinical trials, and starting from January of this month, we are planning to uh, run the third uh, step of clinical trials. And uh, taking into account the position of Kazakhstan and quarantine extension, we have already developed the uh, timely uh, diagnostics of HIV within our population. And to prove the diagnosis, we are using PCR method of uh, uh, HIV uh, for HIV and here on uh, this on these premises we've uh, arrived at timely diagnostics and timely prevention here the majority of the um, AIDS center are validated uh, for the tests of KVI and as of now three laboratories of AIDS center are placed in Chimkent Kustanai uh, and uh, they are engaged in further testings and the test tests are ran right now and uh, the HIV positive patients are getting uh, additional amount of antiretroviral um, medicines uh, from three to six months we have an extension and up to three months for the other patients and during the transport limitations uh, in cities we've uh, realized the uh, additional supply and uh, taking the uh, biological materials at the places of residence of patients we also consulting uh, we were also consulting patients with use of telephone digital technologies by Skype WhatsApp and telemedicine approach distinguished colleagues 
As of now, I think I can finish my presentation. I want to thank you for your kind attention. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yerlan Ansaganovich, we are really seeing the high level of digitalization that is uh, that, that, that you presented, and we are also uh, greeting the, your approach to the development of new vaccine as soon as you will get the posi positive results. Now I want to present the next presenter, Samiridin Partovich Alizada, Deputy Minister of Health Care and Social Protection of Tajikistan Republic, the Chief Sanitary Physician of Tajikistan. Samaridin Partovich, the floor is yours. Greetings, greetings, dear colleagues, distinguished uh, colleagues. I want to greet everybody, uh, dear participants of this symposium. The new coronavirus infects the COVID-19, the first cases that were registered in Tajikistan at the end of April 2020. It affected significantly in a negative way many sides of life of uh, our country. And at the same time, uh, the major load uh, is resulted on the system of health care. Uh, country was struggling against COVID-19 and now we arrive at the certain stability of uh, morbidity in this infection and the day by day uh, restored cases are now more than the registered cases of COVID-19. We've uh, used uh, our experience in uh, a struggling against HIV, uh, even in this case of COVID-19, we've used mobile clinics, four mobile clinics uh, that are sufficient, uh, that are working in the country uh, within the framework uh, led by Russia, uh, framework uh, in uh, policies against HIV and AIDS and other diseases that is led by Russia. And the um, prevention uh, agencies are working also in the view of COVID-19, we are working uh, according to the line of our work. We are also uh, running the uh, projects together with uh, different uh, services that are rendering services against COVID-19. We are also working within the program for 2017-2020, uh, the anti-epidemiological program. We are addressing the key groups of uh, the population, including the population, people living with HIV, with uh, prevention of uh, uh, mother-child transmission of HIV. We are also working uh, with a pool of specialists uh, of, in healthcare, and we are working on the basis of strategy of the United uh, uh, AIDS program at the uh, WHO for 30, 60, and 90. We are also uh, creating additional volumes of testing uh, for uh, HIV and we are outperforming the results for 2020 as of now. Samaritin Partovich, we cannot hear you very well. Could you please speak with the microphone? Yes, I, I think there are some problems with the connection here. And this affected uh, the, the new HIV statistics. We are seeing uh, the additional growth in HIV cases that is registered uh, in com as compared to with 2019. At the same time, we need to say and state that in view of pandemics 2019, we see a progress in treatment in the anti-retrovirus therapy for the new cases during the nine months of 2020, and we see the 94% compared to the 83% for the uh, first nine months of 2019, when we make this comparison. I beg your pardon for these interruptions because of the phone calls. Uh, and uh, on the 30th uh, uh, September uh, of 2020, we have registered 7,630 
people with HIV. According to the recommendations of WHO, we have 87% um, of uh, patients that are under lockdown for uh, because of the HIV and AIDS status. Uh, and they are getting their therapy uh, and they're getting uh, their services uh, in an outpatient care uh, to not be infected by the COVID-19 and we have additional surplus of services for the next three months. We are uh, effectively working uh, on the level of a global fund and we don't have any lack of the services right now. And now we have 67 to 83 and 89 percent compared to the 61, 81 and 74 percent at the beginning of 2020. And we do hope that uh, until the end of 2020 the country will go on the new level, on the better level uh, that will be close uh, to this strategy that we are taking into account. And this is also a part of our work uh, on uh, in terms of uh, the sustainable development. We are fighting against COVID-19, against HIV, and we support uh, our fight and struggle on uh, the level of uh, the monitoring and of the United Program. Uh, against the HIV and AIDS and we are also working with our neighborhood countries from the Central Asia and uh, with other our partners and at the end of my uh, uh, of my speech I want to thank all of you for your kind attention and in the name of Ministry of Healthcare and Social Protection of Tajikistan I want to thank all of you thank all of our partners and uh, tell the words of gratitude I hope we can handle COVID-19 as soon as possible Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samaridin Partovich. Uh, should we have any questions, we will address them during our third session. In the meantime, let me give the floor to our next speaker, that is uh, Bahadir Sukhukhali, first Deputy Minister of Healthcare of Republic of uh, Uzbekistan, Chief Sanitary Doctor. The floor is yours. Great to you, dear colleagues. Can you hear me? Is my microphone on? Yes, it is. We understand that we are going through very challenging times worldwide and in the Republic of uh, Uzbekistan. COVID pandemic is one of the most most difficult challenge we are counteracting in the modern times. But at the same time, thanks to the measures that have been carried out by the government of the Republic of uh, uh, Uzbekistan, we were able to counteract pandemic really successfully. We are doing our best in order to offer the treatment to COVID patients, and we are running a high number number of tests. The president of Uzbekistan passed a decree to set up a Republican commission in order to develop uh, the measures to prevent the uh, prevent the spread of the infection. And this way we were able to mitigate the consequences from COVID. If we look at the incidence rate, it is one of the lowest worldwide uh, and uh, in terms of the number of uh, little outcomes per one million, again, we have a very low rate. This is 0.9% compared to the average of 2.4% worldwide. As of today, we have registered a bit over 70,000 uh, infection cases in the Republic. 67,000 uh, 67, were successfully treated. We are doing our best in order to prevent the spread of the infection. We set up hospitals, provided medical equipment and medicines in order to treat COVID patients. We have improved uh, the equipment of our hospitals and specialized units. We have 
purchased uh, PCR equipment uh, for the labs. We are also uh, providing education for all groups of population and uh, in colleges and uh, schools, we are given an option whether to continue studies offline and online. We are offering regular tests uh, for all teachers and uh, academic community. In all outpatient clinics of the country, we have mobile teams that consist of epidemiologists, infection experts, and so on. We have established screening centers for patients that uh, have light course of disease. We offer all necessary medicines, and these patients stay at home. We continue uh, continually upgrade the treatment protocols. Together with WHO, we have uh, issued recommendations uh, for counteracting coronavirus infection. Our guidelines are uh, local guidelines are constantly upgraded, and at the moment we are working at the. Nine, ninth version of the document. Along with other countries, we are analyzing possibilities for carrying out vaccination, and uh, we are also looking at the possibility of participating in the third phase of uh, clinical trials for the vaccine. Uzbekistan is going to join the COX in order to develop and distribute coronavirus vaccine. As a result of joint uh, work of uh, pharmace with pharmaceutical companies, we have uh, a needed number of uh, personal protection tools and a number of uh, needed tests. We also have a needed number of uh, such medicines as radivitopir, and uh, according to the decree of the President of the Republic, we have integrated transparent mechanisms for medical uh, products prices, and uh, we do not allow an in inadequate increase uh, of prices for medical products. We have a special reference system for price-making policy. We also give uh, lots of attention to our cooperation mechanisms. We actively work with uh, our counterparts in Israel, Russia, Japan, Korea, and so on. And uh, we develop mechanisms to counteract the spread of pandemic jointly. We engage foreign experts in order to increase the educational level of our local experts. We also do our best in order to support uh, patients with HIV uh, during COVID uh, pandemic, and uh, we are able to deliver the antiretroviral medicines um, to patients' homes, uh, and we provide the stock for two or three months in order to exclude the necessity to visit the outpatient clinics by such uh, patients. We did a survey among uh, people with HIV. The survey showed that patients with HIV are well versed uh, about uh, threats of coronavirus um, pandemic, and uh, unfortunately, they have problems in terms of having access uh, with uh, access to certain uh, types of um, uh, medical professionals. Uh, professionals, what is uh, what gave us very important insights, and uh, our first step was to provide the needed medicines uh, to people with HIV, and uh, by giving them a sufficient stock for several months, we were able to 
Uh, let those patients stay at home. Some of the doctors that used to work with uh, HIV patients had to uh, join the, uh, their colleagues uh, to counteract uh, COVID challenge. And this way, we experience the shortage um, in the number of uh, medical professionals. But nevertheless, we increased uh, the possibilities for delivering medicines to such patients and to providing possibility for these patients to stay in touch with the doctors. In late October, the Russian Federation provided mobile clinic to the Republic of uh, Uzbekistan in order to provide medical help to patients located in remote areas. The lab uh, and clinic can uh, work for running tests uh, for very types of infectious diseases that will allow us to provide aid to patients in a timely manner. We also cooperate with our international partners and colleagues. I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, we would like to thank the Russian Consumer Surveillance Agency for all the help they provide to us. Thank you very much. This report was given by Kurbanov Bhutti John Rajaevich, and now I would like to introduce our last speaker. This is Lena Manushan, who is the Deputy Minister of Health from the Republic of Armenia. She will share her experience and her standpoint on those uh, matters. Hello, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends. First of all, allow me to thank you for a possibility to participate in the symposium dedicated to the most concerning topic that is is a COVID pandemic and it's overlapping with HIV epidemic. COVID pandemic is more than a global crisis in healthcare segment. It undermines the economy the well-being of people. We see the increasing tension caused by social economic problems. While HIV outbreaks would last for months or years in order to become epidemic, it took only a couple of months for COVID to spread all over the world. While COVID as HIV is a responsibility not only of the Minister of Health, in order to keep it under control, we need to mobilize all our resources across the society. We approved a number of measures of support. The health, health segment had to mobilize and consolidate in order to provide timely support and medical aid to all patients. Besides uh, introducing the measures in the healthcare sec uh, sector, we had to introduce other measures such as imposing lockdown. And uh, now it is clear that such restrictions have a negative impact on the economic situation as a whole and on integration processes. We do our best in order to keep this pandemic under control, but we need to to understand that no outbreak or pandemic will stop our commitment and dedication to human rights and our commitment to international roles, uh, international rules of uh, and standards in health care. Within the past months, we have done a great deal of work in order to combat the, the COVID infection, but still we're not able to eliminate it fully. We understand that now we are experiencing the second wave of uh, pandemic, and I'm afraid that Armenia has a quiet uh, a disturbing situation, although we have some proposals that we can share. Armenia in May uh, would uh, call the international community to join a number of countries with innovative measures, starting from fundamental scientific solutions, ending up with providing vaccines and uh, medical products. 
COVID pandemic as HIV epidemic is a marathon. Together, we should plan long-term measures in order to keep the infection under control and uh, have progress in solving a number of problems related to uh, public health. Over the 30 years um, of uh, counterating uh, HIV, uh, innovations have been instrumental, such as providing tests and uh, redistributing functions and responsibilities. Engaging communities have also been uh, very helpful, providing social help uh, was important as well. And uh, maintaining uh, prices on adequate level was very important as well. Over the past 30 years, we have developed successful measures to counteract HIV. And these are the lessons we need to take into consideration as we combat uh, COVID. Of course, we also need to consider the mistakes we made uh, in counteracting uh, uh, HIV and some mistakes we made in combating COVID. I would like to thank uh, Russian Consumer Surveillance Agency, UNICE, WHA in supporting Armenia in going through the crisis. Today it is very important to keep united to maintain solidarity in order to overcome the crisis. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lena, thank you, distinguished colleagues. We were happy and glad to listen uh, to your words, and it was very interesting for us to know the experience of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, we are really supporting your efforts in uh, many ways, and we are happy to see that there are also many measures taken for the uh, categories of well, such categories like uh, categories of people with uh, HIV and other non-protected or malprotected uh, categories. We are also happy to listen to your. Uh, descriptions of anti-COVID measures. And now I want to uh, go to the third part of our two days meeting. It will be devoted to the answers on the questions of our viewers and attendants. Now I wanted to present uh, one of the participants. Anna Yurevna Popova is now not, uh, has now left uh, the event, but she will be represented by Smolensky uh, Vyacheslav Yurevich, deputy head of uh, the uh, Russian uh, um, Consumer Surveillance Agency, and I think he will uh, respond to the questions. And now I will read out the first question by our viewers and listeners, and this will be addressed to the WHO, to Hans Kluge, I think, or perhaps to the deputy or to the representatives of Hans Kluge, because now I do not see whether Hans Kluge is online or not. But here is the question. According to the data of WHO, on the 31st of July 2020, 26 vaccine candidates were under trial. 139 vaccines were on the preclinical pre tests. And on the 11th August 2020, we've arrived at the notion of the first uh, Russian anti-coronavirus vaccine. What are the peculiarities of uh, coronavirus uh, and uh, what shall be done for creation of uh, anti-coronavirus vaccine here. Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Kluge. I know we now have listened that there are many vaccines already on the stage of development, and I think the participants who would add and uh, disclose here, uh, I would like to invite you also to the discussion. But now we are asking WHO, and now we want to listen to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm the, so Dr. Hans Kluge has left the, the, the meeting, but I'm the unit lead for HIV and uh, viral hepatitis in the regional office for Europe. Um, I'm not the technical expert on vaccine, but I'm very well aware that uh, a large number of vaccines have uh, undergone the late phase of clinical trial with very good uh, results on efficacy, so it's extremely promising. Um, you've heard from Dr. Hans Kluger that uh, we have a mechanism uh, with a, a 
coalition of members um, named COVAX to support the um, uh, introduction of vaccine in the countries, the deployment. So what uh, the next phase once the um, regulatory authorities approve the vaccines and the vaccine can be deployed is to use a, a strategy to uh, order the vaccines uh, from the different countries giving uh, the local epidemiology of COVID in the countries and the group at risk. So the numbers, the numbers, the first uh, order will be uh, based on the needs for the population most at risk, the people, uh, um, the older people, the healthcare workers are key priority uh, groups together with people with uh, uh, immune deficiency, with cancer treatment, with diabetes and obesity. So um, the next phase is really for countries to um, get their uh, planning in order to deploy the vaccine for the most at-risk people as a first stage. Over. Thank you very much for your response, but I think it would be also very interesting for us to listen to the answer to this question about the peculiarities. What are the peculiarities and special features of the virus? Why there are so many people engaged in the work on uh, the end product against coronavirus? But uh, perhaps Renat Tamirovich Maksutov would uh, answer here. What is your Statement. What could be your statement here? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question. I wanted to tell you that the velocity of the development of different measures, anti-COVID measures, not only in Russian Federation, but in the whole world, it is a fantastic spa uh, speed, fantastic pace, and it is unparalleled in the history. Uh, we are working uh, in a very rapid mode uh, in terms of the development of diagnostic tests in uh, Russian Federation. We've started the development 10 days before the first, uh, um, the first progress was achieved. And now we can say that generally we need uh, five to ten years to provide for an eff efficient and safe uh, uh, vaccine on the market. And now, as of today in the whole world, we see 50 different vaccines on different stages of clinical trials including phase three, post-registration clinical tests. And I'm pretty sure that in the next time, one month or two or three months, the quantity of registered vaccines for prophylactics and prevention of COVID-19 will be more. There will be not only two first developed uh, um, vaccines from Russian Federation, but other uh, vaccines from the whole world. And this space and this speed for the uh, which characterizes work on uh, the introduction of uh, uh, anti-COVID vaccine is speaking about the fact that the WHO and together with WHO, all countries of the world are seeing this the very the very importance here thank you Renata Mirovich you are right here of course because this is unprecedented speed as I can see it here and the quantity of the developments that we see as of now is indeed perhaps not enough as uh, as of today because the market that should be saturated by the diagnostic kits by the test systems and uh, by the antivirus drugs is huge thank you for your responses and now i want to let the floor to ali john salif my next co-moderator deputy director of the republican center for prevention of uh, aids and hiv in tajikistan republic ali john the floor is yours you may ask the next question thank you thank you natalia nikolaevna thank you distinguished colleagues and distinguished presenters the next question i want to formulate it like this and to address it to Vyacheslav Yurievich and the representatives of the deputy of ministers of the CIS countries. How will will solve the issue of COVID-19 vaccination at the level of CIS? Are there any interstate uh, regulations? Thank you, Alijon. 
In the first line, we need to wait for the further information related to the vaccines developed by the Russian Federation in the first head. We need to wait for the post-registration tests of two Russian registered vaccines, and we are also waiting in the nearest time for the third vaccine. All the bilateral contacts are supported, and all multilateral contacts are are also backed by the international uh, organs of healthcare, taking into account uh, participation of institutes of the development. That means that uh, we are now in the state of dialogue. We have uh, also information that uh, the Russian Federation is also supporting uh, multilateral uh, context, context of uh, uh, multilateral use of um, in multilateral tests of the vaccine and our task is in the first line to demonstrate and to show technical information of the results of research for the, for the countries that are planning to use this vaccine. It is also necessary for foreign countries to uh, provide for them full proof of safety of the vaccine and this is also a matter of cooperation within our region in the first line because we are members of one united epidemiological space and here the utmost importance plays the unified and united uh, welfare in these terms a uh, line of documents that were presented uh, by uh, dr popova at the beginning of her presentation is also playing a huge role here because we've developed uh, uh, a set of documents on the levels of uh, heads of the governments uh, within the CIS. Also, the uh, master plan of prevention of infectious diseases. Uh, also, a master plan of uh, the uh, on the issues of uh, cooperations in anti-diseases policies. And this will be a legal framework that we're waiting for. Uh, we are waiting for a legal framework for immune uh, prevention and uh, fighting against coronavirus infection. Thank you. Thank you, Vyacheslav Yurievich. And now I suggest the following. Uh, let, us, let us preserve the policy of presentations. And speaking about vaccinations of uh, Belarus Republic population against coronavirus, now we are also engaged in testing of Vector V vaccine, Russian vaccine. On the basis of the results, we will uh, take the decisions. We have also certain plans for 2021. Now it is a bit preliminary to speak about the plans, but still Vector V is now seen as the main choice and the first choice vaccine for vaccination of population in Belarus. Republic. Thank you. I would suggest that we will speak to Uzbekistan representative Batarjan Zurbaevich. Salam alaikum, al -jan of course, in Uzbekistan, we are also running our plans, and as I already mentioned, Uzbekistan also joined to the COAX company, which is uh, also a part uh, of the global World Global uh, Alliance for Immunization. We are counting on the vaccines. Now, as a country, we will file a claim to the first phase. And as it has been stated by video conference uh, with Gaia, we are planning to initiate first phase and get 500 doses of vaccine as the COAX 500,000 policy plan. And on the next step, we are waiting for up to 5 million doses of vaccine. At, at the same time, in Uzbekistan, as it has been stated uh, by the specialists uh, of a Chinese company, in the recent days, we are starting vaccination by 5,000 doses of uh, produced uh, by Chinese company. This is the third phase of uh, Chinese vaccine vaccine. We are also seeing plans for the phase three uh, testing of Chinese uh, vaccine in Uzbekistan. We are also planning a cooperation with Russia. We are planning to purchase and finalize the contract for migrants, uh, labor migrants, to, for them to get a Russian vaccine. It is, a, uh, it is a part of our cooperative effort in the CIS uh, as 
uh, in terms of uh, purchasing of uh, Russian vaccine. This, uh, this goes along with the plan. And of course, in Uzbekistan, we have our own institute of virus virology, uh, and we are working in line with the best practices of the world, and we are studying the possibility of creation of vaccine. This is not only a part of work of the Ministry of Institute of Virusology. We are also working with uh, the Ministry of Innovations, and we are are applying for grants and uh, here in terms of COVID-19 we are already backing several uh, scientific grants and uh, scientific research. Thank you. Father John Jorabayevich, thank you very much. Now, Armenia. Yes, I would also say the same. Armenia is also working with COVAX facility to provide 10% of the population with vaccine in line with this programs, but in parallel we are working with our Russian colleagues, Russian colleagues and other colleagues uh, that are manufacturers of the vaccine to provide for the other uh, groups of population. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished presenters. I think the author of the question arrived at the answer. And now I would suggest us to go to the next question. I want to represent Sergei Kruchinin, co-moderator from uh, uh, Republic of Belarus. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Alec John. I will speak about the CIS further, and my question is addressed to Vyacheslav Yurievich and to other representatives of uh, CIS countries. How, for how long we will preserve the limitations of uh, uh, transfer of workforce within CIS? Even Russian government says that the economy of the country is uh, experiencing lack in uh, labor. The quantity of labor migrants is cut down by 40 percent. Vyacheslav Yurich, the floor is yours then. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your questions. And again, I want to thank all of my colleagues, Yelena Manukova and Yezhan Jorabayevich and Samaridin and Alexander Alexandrovich for your active engagement in our two days' work. And Yerlan Sakaevich is now offline, unfortunately, but still I want to thank all of you because we are working for a long period of time together and, uh, of course, we are united by this pandemic and by this uh, by this extraordinary event, and I think this is a good basis for our work. We are regularly holding uh, uh, meetings uh, on the level of chief sanitary physicians uh, of all CIS countries. We are discussing the questions and issues uh, bound to the limitations and uh, lockdown, and in the first line, all of colleagues can say and would state that we are led uh, in our work uh, in the first line uh, by the priority of human life and human life is our priority and when we speak about uh, economical issues uh, we uh, are um, assessing human life as more important than uh, eco economical issues and we are speaking in the first line about the risks in uh, healthcare and as soon as situation provides for lifting and uh, of limitations and uh, as uh, uh, our, uh, as Dr. Popova told, we we were also assessing all of the limitations that uh, were imposed, and now we have a possibility to shift uh, the uh, progredients of the infections uh, in, on infection on the uh, on the territory of Russia by two or two and a half months, and we have a possibility to be prepared uh, to the uh, new coronavirus, and we could uh, hereby save thousands and thousands of life and the limitations they played a significant role in other countries uh, I speak about our partners in CIS with different uh, variants of their approaches speaking about the Republic of Belarus uh, Belarus was uh, a bit uh, uh, was not so harsh in imposing uh, of uh, limitations and uh, for our assessment we've developed uh, special criteria and on the basis of the criteria we are assessing situation uh, in other countries and on the basis of this criteria, we can lift uh, the limitations. We see the restoration of avia communication, but still there are certain risks, and they are assessed as sporadic, uh, which means that it is not uh, at its end. Nevertheless, we understand the necessity of uh, 
for resuming the air communication because that has to do with the economic and social integration. So we've been discussing this matter in the Euro with the European Union and CIS countries, but of course we have first of all look at, take into consideration the epidemiologic situation, and as soon as we see that uh, there is no high risk for CIA citizens to move around, these restrictions will be lifted. But this is a gradual effort, considering the rise of respiratory infection is this rate. Uh, we need to assess all the risks, and every two weeks we get together. We every two weeks we get together with the center doctors of uh, the CIA countries. So, summing up, I can say that as soon as conditions are good enough and safe enough, we will be able to resume communication. Thank you very much, Vyacheslav Yurovich. And I would like to pass the floor to Alexander Tarasenko, who is the Deputy Minister of Healthcare of the Republic of Belarus. Alexander, the floor is yours. Well, when it comes to restricting the movement of the citizens in the Republic of Belarus, there are no restrictions per se. There are restrictions uh, for the citizens uh, from so-called red zone, and uh, this uh, covers the following countries: Armenia and Kyrgyzstan. When it comes to CIS countries, however, you still can enter the territory of the Republic of Belarus, but you need to isolate yourselves for 10 days after entering the country. When it comes to green zone countries, it is sufficient to have the PCR test result. Of course, it has to be negative, and uh, it should be made 72 hours prior to your travel. So again, there are no restrictions per se in the Republic of Belarus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander Alexandrovich. Do we? have connection with the Republic of Tajikistan? No? Then I give the floor to the Republic of Uzbekistan, Bakirjon Jorobayevich, the floor is yours. And he is the chief deputy of the sanitary service of the Republic of Uzbekistan. Can you say a few words about that? Once again, good day to you all. We understand that we had to impose certain restrictions related to people free moving around uh, and we understand that some of our migrants are getting back from Russia. We have organized charter flights in order to bring our compatriots home and of course when it comes to air communication this is a multilateral aspect that has to be solved by a number of countries not by a single country alone and we understand that we are talking about international flights that are carried between the countries and uh, right now we organize single charter flights they are organized by Russia or by Uzbekistan in our case and uh, I should say that uh, we already have reached agreements namely with Russia and again we are receiving migrants with PCR negative tests and uh, this is an important condition for a passenger to get on board and uh, of course uh, if uh, there are citizens that are willing to go to their native countries they are able to get on board traveling from our country with PCR test at hand. So as when it comes to vaccination, we would like to offer vaccine to migrant, migrants first and then to people that are contract workers um, in other countries. Well, these are our plans uh, for our republic. 
Thank you. Thank you, Bakir John Jurabayevich. Now I would like to give the floor to Lena Nanushan, who is the Deputy Minister of Health in the Republic of Armenia. Thank you, Sergey. Well, in Armenia, we have no restriction for movements. First, there are requirements to for self-isolation within 14 days, but we have revised our policy and now you need to have PCR test result or you undergo PCR test at arrival at the airport. Thank you, Lena. Now I would like to give the floor to our co-moderator, Natalia Nikolaevna. Thank you. The next question goes to our three participants. Uh, whoever is ready to answer it first can go ahead. And uh, I would like this uh, question to be answered by UNAIDS representatives, by Shannon, and also representatives of WHO. So the question is, can people living with HIV be vaccinated uh, against COVID? And uh, is there going to be any program, vaccination program for HIV patients? Shannon, can you say a few words about any plans for vaccination for HIV patients? So, yes, we do have units. Uh, online, we see that UNAIDS representatives should be online, but why don't we give the floor first to WHO representative. So again, can you answer the question about any possible plans to offer vaccination against COVID to HIV patients? First, I would like to uh, say that um, uh, Community groups have, uh, of people living with HIV have insisted that people living with HIV are included in the clinical trials so that we know the response of the vaccine um, to this population group. And this is the case for a number of uh, clinical trials now. Now in the WHO recommendation on the priority group to be vaccinated, there is no specific mention of people living with HIV because if people living with HIV are well uh, detected and on treatment and virologically suppressed with um, no uh, uh, consequence on their immune system, they are not uh, at specific risk. Uh, but if they have uh, associated uh, comorbidities or um, have weakened immune system because they are the last stage of the disease, they may need they may need to be included, but it's not specified in the current recommendation. So it's not because they are living with HIV that they would be in a priority group. It would be because they are uh, uh, affected by the uh, conditions uh, that are listed in the WHO recommendation. But very important to include them in the clinical trials and see the response to the vaccine in this specific population group. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. So I am the representative of Dr. Shannon Hader, UNAIDS Deputy Executive Director. I will fully echo uh, my WHO colleague. So the studies that have been conducted have shown that there is not any particular risk for people living with HIV and that are controlled through uh, access through, through their treatment to have an increased risk of contracting or developing severe disease or even death due to COVID. However, there is only one study in South Africa that showed people living with HIV, regardless of their level of viral suppression, uh, and people living with CB had worse health outcomes. So we have to take this in, in consideration. For vaccination of people living with HIV, we will work closely with WHO and uh, we will follow the guidelines of WHO. We are working at the same time with communities uh, to make sure that people living with HIV are included in all the decision tables, that they are informed on benefits of the vaccines 
and that we find out any case where people living with HIV or key populations due to their um, pre-existing conditions, pre-existing vulnerabilities might need to be in the first line groups or in the high risk groups that will get vaccinated as per, would need to get vaccinated as per WHO recommendations. So we are working closely with our communities to monitor the situation, to monitor the needs, and then to, to react immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was Mertil Tavansha who answered the question. And um, thank you for your opinion. Indeed, it is a very unclear matter. So far, we do not have a clear understanding how to develop such programs for HIV patients. Of course, we understand some of patients have immune deficit, may have a unique response, a unique immune response but I should say that uh, some countries uh, are being carried out in several countries and uh, also I would like to announce that as of December 1st we will show results of uh, such a study among uh, patients with HIV and uh, HIV patients uh, have a higher vulnerability compared to HIV negative people People. We also have seen a number of publications. There was a meta-analysis that was published in late uh, September that showed that HIV positive have a higher risk of uh, COVID infection compared to the general population. So this uh, question has to be analyzed very thoroughly. And now I would like to address the same question to Ramat Amirovich. Tell us, please, uh, have you you carried out any um, sectoral studies for HIV infected people or at least have you considered this opportunity? Thank you very much for this question. We've made, uh, all, we've made no researches here. We have no uh, specific data to the HIV, and this is the matter of additional clinical trials for this group of patients. And of course, this uh, relates to the issues uh, of uh, particular HIV patients, patients living with uh, HIV. It all depends on the immune status, on the virus uh, type, and uh, on the used vaccines. When we speak about absolutely aerogenic vaccine, which is uh, uh, fully safe, like a synthetic vaccine, Epivac Corona, its use in terms of safety is practically undoubted. It has a is related to no doubts, but we need additional clinical studies. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you for your responses also, and I wanted to let the floor to Sergei Kruchinin, and the next question is to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Natalia Nikolaevna. And I would address the next uh, question to Vyacheslav Yurievich and to Renato Mirovich, and also to all representatives of CIS countries. Which is your forecast? How will it be possible to run a high-scale vaccination in Russia, in your countries, and how many people uh, can be really indeed vaccinated through 2029? Vyacheslav Yurievich, the floor is yours. I think you can start here. Yes, thank you, Sergei. Uh, forecast is not an easy thing when we speak about future, of course. Yes, but we are not forecasting. This is uh, uh, just a matter of fact. What would be your statement? So, my statement is the following. You know, we have been speaking many times about the fact that mass vaccination has to be started as soon as possible. There are different time frames for different vaccines, like 2020 and 2021. And 2021 is the major year for the start of vaccination. And we are in the middle of the discussion of what groups should get their um, immunization for the first uh, as first ones, what are the uh, risk groups 
uh, groups with elevated risk, what, what will be the data on the basis of tests for seniors. And all these are the factors that define in the first line the groups that have to be vaccinated. Firstly, and secondly, we are speaking about the percentage rate uh, between these groups because we know on the basis of flu vaccination uh, and other recommendations from WHO, this is not every time uh, the vaccination of 100% uh, of population because this is not necessary for creation of collective immunity. We are all also studying the immunology approach here to this infection because we know about this infection only for the last 11 or 10 months uh, and to speak about how antibodies are preserved within uh, organisms how protective function is established this is under the discussion and this all relates to the tactics of uh, vaccination to the strategy of vaccination in different countries and this is also a matter of scientific discussion again Saying this, I would revert from the forecast. Here we need to have a real good scientific base which uh, would provide a, for a rendering and for an answer. And here we were speaking about this in June, July, and we were speaking in terms of uh, acute respiratory infections, which is also coronavirus infection. And we have to be in line and to stay in line with all other uh, uh, antivirological um, policies, like limiting of social social distance, uh, mask uh, regime, masking regime, and all this is an effective means to counteract coronavirus infection, also coronavirus infection and other infections. And I want to say the following, the vaccine will not be a final remedy, like for example we will get the vaccine and then we will forget about coronavirus infection. This is not the case. We need to understand that uh, there should be a, a combination of antivirus uh, events and policies. Thank you. Uh, yes, you're welcome, Renata Mirovich. Can you add uh, your, your vision here? What is the forecast from your side? Uh, thank you. I would uh, say that everybody has to believe uh, for the best. Uh, vaccination in Russia and in other countries will start uh, in the first half of the year 2021. I hope so. Uh, thank you. And now we are going to the other countries, Belarus, Republic of Belarus, Alexander Alexandrovich. What is your forecast for Belarus in terms of vaccination? Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Great, thank you. I would agree here with Vyacheslav Yurevich, with my colleague, because forecast uh, is not an easy thing right now. But still, when we work in line with the previous experience uh, with the flu prevention, here I think in the first line, we need to speak about vaccination of risk groups and vulnerable groups. What will be the percentage rate? Uh, we will see it. Will it be 40% for Belarus, uh, Belarus uh, a bit more in Russia? It all depends on the science and uh, on the proven uh, results, results of the test of vaccine. But I think that vaccine is not a final remedy here, but still it will significantly support us in uh, prevention of coronavirus infection. We have plans, but this is also a part of our commercial discussions right now, not to be disclosed. Yes, thank you very much. Bakirjon Kurbanov from Uzbekistan. Yes, um, thank you. As Mr. Smolensky right now told, in Uzbekistan we are also running several policies and we are uh, realizing several events in vaccination. And of course, naturally, as I already stated, 
From the very beginning, according to COVAX policy, we will get for the 10% of the whole population, uh, we will get several doses here, and until the second half of June, we will get approximately 5 million of uh, doses, and additionally to that, we are engaged uh, in uh, talks and uh, we are dealing with private structures which uh, will also provide private uh, vaccination because now this is the international policy for the whole world. In uh, the whole world, we are waiting for the first registered vaccine and for the second uh, start of commercializing of vaccine because as of now, we know that this Chinese company, Sinopharm, is also uh, has also ended the third phase of uh, trials and Pfizer also ended these uh, commercial trials, uh, these trials for American vaccine and we are pretty sure that they will start selling their vaccine in 2021. As soon as we will get vaccine, we will start vaccinations, mass vaccination. And Uzbekistan is planning for the next year, 2021, until June, we plan to vaccinate more than 60% of our population. Thank you, distinguished uh, member of the board, Batyazhon. And now I'm letting the floor to Lena Nenashan. Uh, what is your forecast for Armenia? Thank you. I want also to join my colleagues because, of course, we see many questions and many issues here, and uh, your question is also depending on many multiple factors, whether it will be reinfection, how uh, long will it take for the immunity to be established uh, and persist, uh, how can we get the vaccine to the majority of our population. But I want to speak about another aspect here. This is the preparation for vaccination, because we need to be prepared. There are many things to be done right now on the level of our countries. We need to train our specialists. We need to define risk groups, uh, vulnerable groups. We need to provide for the logistic system. And here there are many things to be done. And we also need to train our population, overall population. That means we have a lot of work to do before vaccination will be started. Yes, thank you. And for the next question, I would like to let the floor to distinguished Natalia Nikolaevna. Thank you, Sergei. Uh, Sergei, now I have uh, several questions. They uh, have uh, pretty same topics, and they are addressed to Renata Mirovich. And for question number one is, will we see the vaccine in commercial sales? Uh, channels because we have no other manufacturers of vaccine as of today because this is the vec uh, question for the vac vector will people be able to choose what uh, to choose between different vaccines and the second question is uh, are you planning sales of vaccines Sputnik uh, V uh, to other countries and how to buy it yes thank you thank you very much and speaking about the all vaccines that are manufactured by the state center uh, uh, of Im Im immunology, uh, the vaccine will be for free, uh, free of charge for the citizens of Russia. And there is, we are not speaking about commercial sales. All the vaccines, uh, all the doses will be free of charge for the citizens of Russia. When we speak about export of this vaccine, here we can speak about this only in case when we will scale up our manufacturing uh, facilities and manufacturing possibilities, capacities. Uh, after we will provide for the for all needs of the population of Russia and as a part of humanitarian help it can be rendered to the other countries but I think it's a preliminary issue to speak about uh, sales of the vaccine in other countries and here we will provide for the access and for the possibilities of choosing between uh, types of vaccines for the citizens of Russia uh, in terms of their protection uh, two vaccines are already registered in Russia there will 
will it is also an inactivated uh, virus pending uh, registration all uh, the vaccines are se uh, set up for different serological platforms or uh, this third vaccine will be registered and uh, the, which means that safety and uh, feasibility of use for those vaccines will be established and uh, the customers the uh, end receivers will choose uh, I thank you Renat Mirovic for your clear answer to these topics and questions and we have a brief question from our listeners uh, they are asking when will it be possible to read about peptide vaccine in scientific literature yes thank you for this particular question the publications are filed uh, to the scientific journals uh, peer-reviewed journals and after a due diligence and uh, uh, they will be accessible yeah thank you very much and now Sergey will ask the next questions from our listeners the floor is yours Sergey could you please put on your microphone uh. Yes. I beg your pardon. First, thank you, Natalia Nikolaevna. I have a question about the following. Do we have a possibility of shaping of collective immunity in a natural way before mass vaccination? Or instead of it, uh, because uh, there were some idea, some notions by a Russian Consumer Surveillance Agency about the cities where people uh, and population has about 50% of uh, antibodies to COVID-19. So I would address this question to Vyacheslav Yurievich. Yes, as Anna Popova, Dr. Popova, told today in her presentation, we have scientific data in different regions in two steps on the basis of our. Uh, uh, Pasteur Institute, Research and Development Institute, by use of the test systems um, from Abolensk uh, State Center in Abolensky and Microbiology Institute. We were holding the tests in June and August. Uh, in September of uh, in October, we passed the step one, and uh, in uh, 20, in the year 2021, we will have the second step. And there is a difference between immune. Uh, status of uh the whole population, up to 60%, uh, we've seen the highest results in these terms, and uh, we've seen antibodies and registered antibodies in uh, the population. It was uh, due to the intensity of the process, and inten the more intensive the process uh, is, the more uh, people with antibodies we see. But we need to speak about the sustainability of this uh, immune response uh, which was already touched uh, upon by our colleagues and we are speaking about uh, the persistence of the results and of the data uh, gathered uh, in the first line uh, uh, the Russian consumer surveillance agency is assessing this information and this is a necessary tool for us to take uh, the decisions in management of uh, antiviral policies thank you Vyacheslav Yurievich I would ask to add uh, to this question to Nicole Sigui, Sigui, excuse me, from the WHO and Nutilo Tavanshi units. So, what is your opinion about this matter so, regarding the collective immunity? You know that I'm not the vaccine specialist. I would like to withdraw from this. Поэтому я бы хотела воздержаться, воздержаться от от. Thank you. Maybe Natila can answer this question. Um. Okay. So I am a medical doctor, but again, not an immunologist. Uh, still, uh, from what I read in the press, um, we have seen that the experiments to boost herd immunity, like it started to be in the UK, like uh, what Sweden um, has tried to do, have failed. So, from what I read as a non-specialist, I would say that we probably might not be able to create herd immunity 
um, to help the to to help with the vaccine or before using the the vaccine. To this, I will have to add also some concerns that we had with um, the antibodies, with detection of antibodies, and then some crossover uh, between antibodies uh, from other coronaviruses and, and, and the COVID virus. So there are all these concerns, personally, not on behalf of UNAIDS, not as a person specialized in vaccine and immunology, I'm not a big believer on herd immunity before using the vaccine. Thank you very much. And now I would like to pass the floor to my colleague Natalia Nikolaevna for the next question. Thank you, Sergey. Actually, time is up, and this will be the last question, and then we will give the opportunity to our speakers to voice final remarks. I believe that this question will be addressed to Victor. However, if if any of you have any scientific data, data, you certainly can share it with us. So how do people uh, feel after vaccination, in the first days after vaccination? Uh, what, uh, what, can, what kind of information do you have as of this matter? Well, when it comes to Epivac Corona vaccine, we don't have have uh, full data because all were vaccinated uh, as part of clinical trial and uh, people were isolated for the 20 for 21 days and uh, so the interval between the first and second vaccination so on a daily basis they were tested for the uh, presence of uh, RNA of SARS-CoV-2 and results were negative so I cannot answer the question about the use of peptide vaccine epivac corona and I cannot tell you whether uh, there was uh, any worsening of condition uh, for those who could be already infected because we don't didn't have such a population and um, we know uh, from general data that in the number of uh, cases, vaccination can alleviate the overall uh, overall condition of a patient. We know that uh, the uh, smallpox uh, is a good example in that regard because if you use the vaccine after the contact uh, with the pathogen, uh, the course of the disease will will go in a smoother way and uh, but at the same time it is uh, recommended to stay away from the contact once you undergo a vaccination and that is very helpful to decrease the risks so as of today when it comes to COVID infection, we don't have any data available, so we cannot say with certainty uh, about uh, any recommendations. How about your evaluation? What is your personal opinion? Well, this has to do with the vaccine platform that you use. and. Uh, we are going to use a vaccine platform based on uh, the peptide antigens, and uh, that implies uh, possibility possibility to use a vaccine after confirmed contact with the virus. But so far, it is uh, the field uh, for future research, and uh, we cannot extrapolate the data for the humans. Uh, I think uh, this also could be a counteraction, counterindication for using the vaccine. Okay, clear. Thank you very much. Thank you for your opinion. It's very interesting. Well, dear colleagues uh, from UNAIDS or WHO, uh, do you have anything to add in this regard? I understand not. Okay, thank you very much. Well, dear colleagues, 
we are coming to the end of our event and this is a time to give final remarks. We would like to hear the opinions of representatives of republics of Belarus, Uzbekistan and Armenia. Historically, we will start with a representative of the Republic of Belarus. So what are your impressions about today's events and your recommendations and your proposals? Well, I believe that this session is an excellent platform for exchanging opinions. We were able to discuss most sensitive issues and I sincerely hope that all our focus and plans will be implemented and hopefully we will be able to mitigate all the risks and problems related to COVID infection. Uh, how about Uzbekistan, Baterjan, Murambayevich, the floor is yours. Well, it is a very impressive event, and thank you very much for organizing it. I wish each and every of you success in combating coronavirus infection, and uh, it's heartening to realize that we have great scientific potential and prospects for international cooperation are great. I would like all of you to stay healthy and um, it will be great to receive the presentations given by our speakers, especially presentation of uh, Anna Popova, because it provides lots of analytical data that is very valuable for us. So if uh, it is possible to pass the presentation of Anna Popova, it would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I pass the floor to Lina, representative of Armenia. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to ask you to send us the copies of presentations because they were very interesting and relevant for us. And uh, I would like to thank you for organizing all events that took place since January. They indeed have been very helpful for us and they helped us a lot in uh, combating COVID, um, in, uh, COVID pandemic. I hope we will continue our cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you all the speakers. Thank you uh, our viewers. We'd like to thank our interpreters. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Vyacheslav Smolensky to wrap up our meeting. Vyacheslav. Thank you, Natalia. I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank all the speakers. I'd like to thank our partners from WHO, from UNAIDS. And uh, UNAIDS have been our coach here for the pending forum in April. Thank. I would like to thank WHO. I would like to thank Hans for his commitment. I would like to thank Nicole for participating and for answering the questions. Um, well. I would like to thank the Secretariat for organizing the event and making it possible in such a format. I'd like to thank our colleagues from the CIS countries. We indeed value our interaction and uh, it is heartening to interact with you in bilateral or multilateral way. Uh, you know that we are always open and ready to help you in any day, time, any time of day or night. And I should say this is not our last uh, meeting on our way to prepare to, for the forum. And uh, we will be willing to see our colleagues at the forum to be held in St. Petersburg. And I hope that we will have a great face-to-face -face meeting and it will be very helpful to discuss all the issues related to coronavirus infection. And I would like to emphasize that uh, Russian Consumer Surveillance Agency, Rospotrebnadzor, have a vertically integrated system and it will provide us with a, with a great 
great results. And even under these challenging times, it's good that we have uh, important uh, data that help us helps us make right decisions. And indeed, science plays a very important role in planning events, and we should rely on uh, scientific data. And it's good that today we have an opportunity to hold uh, scientific research, and we are ready for joint international uh, research, uh, especially within uh, HIV AIDS, um, jo uh, joint international programs, and uh, that will help us to provide better protection for our populations. Thank you all. Natalia.